I'm passionate about Cosmos Consciousness God. Some may say I'm obsessed. Why? What's the reason? Well, I just love thinking about big questions. I cannot do otherwise. Could there be deeper reasons, reasons of which I'm not even aware? I've examined mental activities from diverse perspectives, but always focusing on awareness, what it feels like to be conscious. Yet there is more to the fullness of mental lives than the current content of our present awareness. It's called the subconscious, perceptions, thoughts, emotions that are not accessible to our conscious awareness, but which directly affect what we sense, think, feel, and do. How does the subconscious affect us? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. Are my perceptions influenced by subconscious forces? My thoughts engineered? My emotions manipulated? How does the subconscious work its magic? First, what counts as subconscious? Any mental activity that does not enter our present awareness, our consciousness. In other words, mental activity of which I am not aware. How can I dig into my own subconscious, gain insight into why I do what I do? One approach is to find specific examples of the subconscious in action, then worry what it may mean. I begin with a neuroscientist and writer whose book, Incognito, focuses on what's hiding in the unconscious world, David Eagleman. David, you've really made the point that most of what we do mentally, behaviorally, we have no idea. Let's discuss that. That's exactly right. So it turns out that the vast majority of what we think and do and believe is generated by parts of our brain that we have no acquaintance with, no access to at all. When you think of an idea, when you say, oh, I just thought of something, it wasn't actually you. Your brain's been cooking that under the surface for days or weeks and it serves it up to you and you say, hey, I'm a genius, I just thought of something, but it wasn't actually you because in this vast, you know, wet biomechanical network that's happening under there, that's where most of our life is actually happening. Um, and so there are many interesting examples that have come out about unconscious influences on people's lives. It turns out you're statistically more likely to marry somebody else whose first name begins with the same first letter as your first name. So Joel and Jenny or Donnie and Daisy. Things like this are, are small effects, but they're statistically verifiable. And the important part is they're not part of people's conscious narrative. So it's even affecting behavior, affecting things that you decide upon that you don't know why you've done it. That's exactly right. And there's a whole category of things like this. It turns out if you're holding a warm mug of coffee, you will describe your relationship as your mother as being closer than if you're holding a cup of iced coffee. If you're given a political opinion questionnaire and, and you happen to be standing next to a hand sanitizer, you will your political opinions will become more conservative, presumably because of a threat of outside uh, forces. <laughs> Does that give any justification to all all the Freudian, subconscious, psychoanalytic stuff that's largely been discredited over the years? Ah, well that, that part has not been discredited. So, <clears throat> so Freud was the first one to really nail the idea of the unconscious. It turns out there's been a long history, since at least the 1200s, of people suspecting that you wouldn't be able to explain everything about human nature just by sort of rational this and that. What has fallen out of favor are very, you know, particular things he said about it, but the idea that your conscious mind is just the tip of the iceberg is really correct. That part has not changed. Now, Freud lived before the blossoming of modern neuroscience, so we know a lot more now and we can sort of try to dig down in there. So with all you've done in understanding all these systems that are subconscious, how then does it make you feel about the control that you have yourself of your own behavior? I mean, I think the system as a whole makes choices and decisions. One can think about the brain as a company with a CEO atop and all the 100,000 employees underneath. Who makes the decision in a corporation? The answer is 
the entire corporation makes that decision. The, the CEO can't go off and do something completely wacky. He's tied into the core competencies of the company. They can't do stuff without the CEO. He can't do stuff without them. The system as a whole makes choices and decisions. It interacts with the rest of the world and it navigates itself through the world. Our psychic depths are a cauldron of fragmentary thoughts and shards of emotion, bubbling belief they do not break into awareness, but many make impact, some cause conflict. That's a bit scary. I want to be fully in control, not just feel that way. I guess I cannot. What about my core personality? Does my consciousness have control? Is my subconscious the boss? How variable is my subconscious? How powerful? I ask an expert on the malleability of human memory, including repressed and false memories, yeah, cognitive psychologist memory. Elizabeth Loftus. Beth, many people say that our subconscious activities are dramatically important in making us what we are. As an experimental psychologist, how do you see that? There are a number of different ways you can think about the unconscious. I mean, is it, is it something that's smart or is it dumb? Uh, is, it, is it smart in the sense that there are things in there that are driving us to behave in destructive ways, a little creature in there that's forcing us into these activities? That would be the kind of smart unconscious. Um, I'm not sure I've seen any evidence for that. There is evidence for what you might want to call it a dumber unconscious that we could, we are influenced by stimuli that we're not even aware have influenced us. And so in that sense, we are kind of responding automatically based on these either subconscious or unconscious uh, uh, details or aspects of our environment. I'm, I'm not sure I've got a really good example to give you, but um, one that I've often used in, in, in a class that I taught, where I'll, I'll, I'll try the ocean moon. No, no, let me ask you this. Give me the name of a detergent. First one that comes tide. to mind. Tide. Well, turns out I made you say tide. <laughs> because, you, because you planted ocean. I, I said ocean moon, and uh, that will increase the likelihood people will say tide. You ask them, why'd you say tide? Uh, do you use Tide? Well, no. Um, well, why did you say it? Of course, some people will say Tide anyhow, but many more will if you prime them with this, these words, and they weren't even aware that that had influenced them. You're smart, you figured it out, but... Well, this brings up the whole area of repressed memories and the whole psychoanalytic tradition, starting with Freud and many of his followers, that say that many of our, uh, our problems are as a result of repressed memory from childhood or sexual abuse or all sorts of things. The theory is that we have these horrible brutalizations that happen to us that they're too painful for us to you know, deal with. So that we wall them off, bury them in the unconscious, and that somehow you can go in, do some little therapy and dig out these repressed memories and that you have to do this with people in order to cure them of their problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, it turns out there is no credible scientific support for the idea that memory works like that. There is support for the idea that you can have things happen to you, even bad things, unpleasant things, not think about them for a long time and be reminded of them later. But the idea that there is some process, like massive repression, that banishes these experiences into the unconscious, no credible scientific support for this. So what are the implications for our understanding of our own subconscious uh, 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 thoughts that affect our behaviors? Oh, I, I do believe that we are influenced by, by stimuli, things that happen to us, things we hear or see or are exposed to, and we're not even aware of those, of those influences. Uh, and there's just a whole lot more to be learned about that. Good, I'm relieved. It seems a mistake to exaggerate subconscious powers, though we cannot ignore unfelt factors that affect our thoughts, feelings, and actions. I'd prefer if matters of the subconscious remain small and anecdotal. But are there subconscious examples that are large? Can any be studied scientifically? 
I go to Cambridge, England to meet a psychologist who studies the evolution of human intelligence and consciousness, Nicholas Humphrey. Nick, I hear, has found a strange phenomenon. Nick, once in a while something comes up which shakes my understanding of my own sense of psychic unity. Blindsight, which you have pioneered, is one of them. Help me understand how it works and why it changes our perception of what consciousness is. After damage to the visual cortex at the back of the brain, you can get a subject who is apparently completely blind and will say that there's no sensation in this part of his visual field. You know, doctor, there's nothing there. Uh, you know, don't expect me to, to be able to tell you anything about that part of the world. And the doctor can say, yes, I understand what you're saying. But just imagine, suppose there was a light out here in this blind part of the field. Um, where would it be? Can you point at it? The subject points at it. <laughs> suppose it, it has a colour. What colour would it be? Well... Make a guess. Well, I guess it's red. What shape is it? A circle or a cross? Oh, it's a cross. And all the time the subject will say, yes, but there's no sensation there. I'm not conscious of anything. I don't have any reasons for the judgments, the guesses which I'm making. Now, that discovery really uh, opened up a whole new way of, of looking at uh, consciousness, the possibility that the were consciousness has separate different different channels. And in my own work as I developed it, I became increasingly interested in the nature of what was missing in the cases of blind sight. Blind sight subjects can apparently take in information about the world, but it doesn't feel like anything. Mm. There's nothing there for them. Sensation isn't present. They don't feel involved in it. They don't feel that it's their uh, take on the world. It's just a guess. Now, I came to it through a series of uh, I mean, seven years of studying one particular monkey. And my supervisor had done an, an operation to remove the physical cortex at the back of the brain of this monkey. And when I first met her, she seemed to be completely blind, as, as of course, conventional neurophysiology would have said she would be. The visual cortex is gone. How, else, how could she possibly see? I spent just a few days, to begin with, sitting with her, playing with her, and it became obvious to me almost at once that the story was wrong. This monkey was seeing much more than she ought to be able to. Um, and within a few days, uh, I got her reaching out to touch my fingers when I held up a piece of apple, for example. Um, and uh, we began to interact in, in ways which should have been impossible. Well, from there, it, her sight began to burgeon. In fact, I worked with that mon one monkey for the next seven years. Um, I adopted her as a kind of pet. Um, I moved to another laboratory in the country outside Cambridge where I could take her for walks in the field um, and I would walk around the village on a leash and we would just interact in the presence of objects to the point at which she became, her vision had seemed to have returned to complete normality. She could catch a fly as it passed by. Mm. She could run around a room, picking up things, avoiding obstacles. Everything seemed to be completely normal. But I was certain it actually wasn't normal. There was something very strange about her vision. She seemed only to be able to see if she didn't try too hard to see. If she was frightened, for example, she suddenly became completely blind again. Um, and I began to to speculate, it was speculation at that point, that what was missing was that she really didn't know that she could see. She could only do it when she didn't try too hard. As soon as she thought about, can I see or not, apparently she couldn't. Well, I, I wrote a, an article back, I think in 1972, suggesting that this was a new form of vision which lacked conscious sensation, um, but was nonetheless uh, delivering some kind of visual perception. But it was a guess. Then Larry Weisskrantz, a couple of years later, discovered the first human case of, of blind sight, where the subject could actually be asked what's going on. And that confirmed this extraordinary uh, phenomenon that, yes, indeed, the subject is consciously blind and yet has the capacity to take in and use visual information to form perceptual representations. Blindsight is so blatant, it cannot be ignored. Perception teased apart from awareness? Yes. Blindsight proves that perceptions of which we are not aware can and do affect our states of mind. My fear resuscitates. What else lurks in the deep recesses of my mind? 
I'd better push boundaries, explore the depths of the subconscious. That would be dreams. Are dreams a window of the subconscious? I meet an expert on dreams, the director of the Evolutionary Neurobehavior Laboratory at Boston University, Patrick McNamara. Patrick, some of the work that you've done in dreaming and nightmares are things that we don't control but affect us. So I'm trying to dig below the activeness of consciousness to understand what makes our consciousness. Yeah, dreams happen to us whether we like it or not, you know? <laughs> and they affect our behavior whether we like it or not. We can't stop dreaming. And Freud obviously argued that dreams were a major source of the superego and of consciousness itself. Though I never really understood why he said that. I'm not, you know, I'm convinced that dreams are, are linked to daytime waking consciousness, but you know, the steps linking the two are obscure to me. Certainly they're, they're linked. They're, you know, the dreams influence who we are. They, they influence how we build up a self. So in that sense, the self is central to consciousness and the self depends on dreams to some extent. Well, certainly our consciousness is, is built upon these uh, subconscious or unconscious modules that we have. The fact that I don't remember any dreams I've had in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Could it be that those dreams that I've had are actually affecting me more than I realize? I would say yes. Uh, you know, one, thing, one fact that's understudied about dreams is the extent to which they're shared. Once you remember them, Certainly in all other cultures, up, up till the modern era, the, the dreams were prime things to share. If you had a dream, you, the idea was to share it, tell your dream, because you would gain fitness benefits. By telling your dream? Sure, you, you, would, you would enhance your reputation, particularly if you had a nightmare. I think my dreams would have hurt my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> They're one of these subroutines that are going on yeah. all the time. Subroutine is a good word because yeah. that, I mean, it, it's they happen like, automatically. They produce a certain output. The output affects behavior in some way. But if we have nightmares, uh, sometimes that will sort of affect your, your, your self feeling during, during the day, the next day. It'll, the mood lingers. It'll all, the mood lingers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it does affect your, your conscious emotion, what, what you are. Yes, I think so. And even dreams, not, not just nightmares, even dreams. Most dreams, particularly REM dreams, have moods associated with them. And they linger. You know, they're, you know one of the best examples of this is visitation dreams. Oh. You know, if you've ever lost somebody you loved, right. it's, uh, this, people report it all the time. Somebody they love is gone. Two months later, the person appears in the dream. But they're not like they were right before they died. They're not ill. They're not sick. They're sort of younger and they're more healthy. They, they, who they were when they were at their prime. And they, and they give you a message. And the message is, I'm okay. Don't worry about me. I'm still with you somehow. That's got to be one of the sources of religion and supernatural agent concepts. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had a, this powerful dream, well, they're not gone. I felt them. Mm -hmm. I saw them, I felt them, I still do, I'm awake, I'm still feeling the presence of that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that really is evidence for supernatural agent concepts, at least in ancient cultures. Dreams indeed linger, especially their affect, their emotional valence. On occasion, I will carry throughout the day the feelings of the night. It's disorienting, disconcerting, a vague sense that seemingly has no cause. How to describe it? Nonverbal presence, unpleasant pressure, an air of expectation, some kind of secret? I often trace those low-grade psychic disturbances to the prior night's dream, even though I usually cannot recall what the dream was about. In pushing the subconscious to find its limits, there is one area beyond dreams. Throughout history, the subconscious has been linked to mystical powers. Could the subconscious be some kind of receiver of non-traditional information? I explore this with the director of the Innovation Lab at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, Julia Mossbridge. I'm a skeptic, but the kind of skeptic who hopes to be wrong. Julia, you've looked at the unconscious. What can we 
understand about these aspects of our mentality that might help us understand the external reality. Okay, this reminds me of a story. Um, my son was four years old, and he came up to me, and uh, he had a quarter in his hand. And he's like, um, okay, I'm doing a magic trick. Okay. Um, you see the quarter? Yeah, I see the quarter. Okay. Excuse me for a second. <laughs> he puts it in his pocket. <laughs> Abracadabra, it's gone, <laughs> right? So as his mother, I have two responses, one of which I tell him, right? The one I tell him is like, oh, look what you did, the quarter's gone, where did it go, <laughs> right? Internally, I'm thinking, you know, I taught you that trick, <laughs> right? <laughs> so to me, that's very much about the relationship between conscious mind and the unconscious mind, okay? and the unconscious mind's relationship with reality. So the parent is the unconscious mind. And it's in the parent's interest that the conscious mind, the child, thinks that it's you know, so great and can do its thing and it's all on its own and everything, right? And the child, it's in the conscious mind's best interest to really believe that story. The unconscious mind has access to so much more information like a parent. When you say information, you, you, mean, you don't mean just internal information. You mean external reality information. I will say yes, that that is what I mean. The first part we know from yeah. mainstream science. Right. The second part is uh, a leap from my research and from my own um, you know, meditation practice and intuition. Yes, I, I think that the, the, the parent or the unconscious mind is the one that really has all the information and can have all the information, and only gives the child or the conscious mind the information that's useful for it. Because it's beneficial to the unconscious mind for our little conscious selves to go around thinking that we're independent beings, and that we're, we're not connected, and that time goes in one direction. Whereas the unconscious, you're saying, is somehow connected to the more fundamental reality of some kind? That's my intuition gives the consciousness little tidbits of information that it as thinks needed. as needed. On a need-to-know <laughs> basis. <clears throat> And um, certainly the unconscious mind we know is more connected to information that comes in through the, sen the senses. Right. Right, we know that. And only gives information as appropriate for the task and in the situation. So mm -hmm. already it seems smarter. Right. right. Already it seems to have more information. And what I'm saying is in intuitively, intuitively my sense is that we will eventually find that the unconscious mind's version of reality is in fact closer to physical reality. And what is that? What is the unconscious mind's version of reality? I think it's at least time symmetric, if not non-local in space and time. Okay, so those are two concepts. And to be time symmetric means that the unconscious can see uh, not just what happened in the past, but can see what's happening in the future? Right. So here I am traveling a long time, and I'm looking both directions with some kind of drop-off. That's the so, so what you've described is the temporal non-locality, or at least symmetrical in both directions, but you think it could all be, also be spatially. I'm impressed by these studies on remote viewing. So I'm impressed okay. by those results. Right, okay. So, so that's where the spatial thought comes from. Right. And when you talk to remote viewers, um, they have to train themselves to and essentially tap into unconscious processes and they have to kind of trick themselves to do it. Almost like in psychoanalysis people do that, uh, yogis do that, uh, any kind of meditators do that. So there, there are ways that we can receive sort of information more than we usually get, I think, from the unconscious uh, information data bank. Um, and you have to train, it's a practice. So in your worldview, you see the unconscious as really the primary um, link between uh, the human person in, in its broadest sense and external reality in its uh, both temporal and spatial uh, dimensions. Yes. I wish I said that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And we can actually learn to get some of that information. But only when the subconscious feels that it should give consciousness a little tidbit here and there. That's my sense. <laughs> maybe that's wrong. <laughs> ah, maybe that's wrong. Uncertainty is good. So are radical theories that the subconscious might somehow resonate with the great beyond. Not because I think the theory to be right, but because when it comes to mind, it's not that a theory is too radical, it's whether a theory is radical enough.
I've long ignored my own subconscious. I can do so no longer. The subconscious comes in diverse forms. Sensory perceptions, subliminal suggestions, dreams and their lingering affect. As for the Freudian view, there's scant scientific evidence that our subconscious determines our behaviors and runs our lives. Could our subconscious link with deep reality? That'd be fun, wouldn't it? But unlikely, not impossible. To understand myself, introspection does help, though I'm still not sure how much. But if I study the subconscious in order to help explain consciousness, I'm afraid I've not made much progress. More is needed to get closer to truth. For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.